Book Two, Chapter Thirteen, of the Mermaid. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Mermaid by Lily Dougal. Book Two. Chapter Thirteen. White birds, white snow, white thoughts. By degrees Caius was obliged to give up his last lingering belief in the existence of the lady he loved. It was a curious position to be in, for he loved her none the less. Two months of work and thought for the diseased people had slipped away, and by the mere lapse of time, as well as by every other proof, he had come to know that there was no maiden in any way connected with Madame Le Maître, who answered to the visions he had seen or who might be wooed by the man who had ceased to care for all other women for her sweet sake. After Caius had arrived, the epidemic had become worse, as it had been prophesied it would, when the people began to exclude the winter air from their houses. In almost every family upon the little isle there was a victim, and Caius, under the compelling force of the orders which Madame Le Maître never gave and the wishes she never expressed, became nurse as well as doctor, using what skill he had in every possible office for the sick, working early and late, and many a time the night through. It was not a time to prattle of the sea-maid to either Madame Le Maître or O'Shea, who both of them worked at his side in the battle against death, and were, Caius verily believed, more heroic and successful combatants than himself. Some solution concerning his lady-love there must be and Caius neither forgot nor gave up his intention of probing the lives of these two to discover what he wished. But the foreboding that the discovery would work him no weal made it the easier to lay the matter aside and wait. They were all bound in the same icy prison. He could afford patience. The question of the hospital had been solved in this way. Madame Le Maître had taken O'Shea and his wife and children to live with her and such patients as could be persuaded or forced into hospital were taken to his house and nursed there. Then, also, as the disease became more prevalent, people who had thus far refused all sanitary measures, in dire fear opened their doors, and allowed Caius and O'Shea to enter with whitewash brushes and other means of disinfection. Caius was successful in this, that, in proportion to the number of people who were taken ill, the death-rate was only one-third of what it had been before he came. He and his fellow-workers were successful also in a more radical way, for about the end of January it was suddenly observed among them that there were no new cases of illness. The ill and the weak gradually recovered. In a few more weeks the angels of death and disease retired from the field, and the island was not depopulated. Whether another outbreak might or might not occur they could not tell but knowing the thoroughness of the work which they had done, they were ready to hope that the victory was complete. Gradually their work ceased, for there was no one in all the happy island who needed nursing or medical attendance. Caius found then how wonderfully free the place was from all those ailments which ordinarily beset humanity. This was in the middle of February, when the days were growing long, and even the evening was bright and light upon the islands of snow and the sea of ice. It appeared to Caius that Madame Le Maître had grown years older during the pestilence. Deep lines of weariness had come in her face, and her eyes were heavy with want of sleep and sympathetic tears. Again and again he had feared that the disease would attack her, and, indeed, he knew that it had only been the constant riding about the island hills in the wonderful air that had kept the little band of workers in health. As it was, O'Shea had lost a child, and three of the girls in the house of Madame Le Maître had been ill. Now that the strain was over, Caius feared prostration that would be worse than the disease itself for the lady who had kept up so bravely through it all. But, ever feeling an impossibility in her presence of speaking freely of anything that concerned herself, he had hardly been able to express the solicitude he felt before it was relieved by the welcome news that she had travelled across the bay to pay a visit to Pembroke's wife. She had gone without either telling Caius of her intention or bidding him good-bye, 
and glad as he was, he felt that he had not deserved this discourtesy at her hands. Indeed, looking back now, he felt disposed to resent the indifference with which she had treated him from first to last. Not as the people's doctor, in that capacity she had been eager for his services, and grateful to him with a speechless, reverent gratitude that he felt to be much more than his due. But as a man, as a companion, as a friend, she had been simply unconscious of his existence. When she had said to him at the beginning, "'You will be lonely. There is no one on the island to whom you can speak as a friend,' he perceived now that she had excluded herself as well as the absent world from his companionship. It seemed to him that it had never once occurred to her that it was in her power to alter this. Truly, if it had not been for Pembroke, the clergyman, Caius would never have had a companionable word, and he had found that there were limits to the interest he could take in Pembroke, that the stock of likings and disliking that they had in common was not great. Then, too, since the day on which he had questioned him so vehemently about the relatives of Madame Le Maître, he fancied that the clergyman had treated him with apprehensive reserve. At the time when he had little or nothing to do, and when Madame Le Maître had left Cloud Island, Caius would have been glad enough to go and explore the other islands, or to luxuriate again in the cookery of the old maids at the inn at which he had first been housed. Two considerations kept him from this holiday-taking. In the first place, in a fear of a case of illness he did not like to leave the island while its benefactress was away. And secondly, it was reported that all visitors from the cloud were ruthlessly shut out from the houses upon the other islands, because of the unreasoning terror which had grown concerning the disease. Whether he, who carried money in his pocket, would be shut out from these neighboring islands also, he did not care to inquire. He felt too angry with the way the inhabitants behaved to have any dealings with them. The only means of amusement that remained to Caius in these days were his horse and a gun that O'Shea lent him. With his lunch in his pocket, he rode upon the ice as far as he might go and return the same day. He followed the roads that led by the shores of the other islands. Or where the wind had swept all depth of snow from the ice, he took a path according to his own fancy on the untrodden whiteness. Colonies of arctic gulls harbored on the island, and the herring gulls remained through the winter. These, where he could get near their rocks upon the ice, he at first took delight in shooting, but he soon lost the zest for this sport, for the birds gave themselves to his gun too easily. He was capable of deriving pleasure from them other than in their slaughter, and often he rode under their rocky homes, noting how dark their white plumage looked against their white resting-places, where groups of them huddled together upon the icy battlements and snowdrift towers of the castles that the frost had built them. He would ride by slowly, and shoot his gun in the air to see them rise and wheel upward, appearing snow-white against the blue firmament, and watched them sink again, growing dark as they alighted among the snow and ice. His warning that he himself must be nearing home was to see the return of such members of the bird colony as had been out for the deep-sea fishing. When he saw them come from afar, flying high, often with their wings dyed pink in the sunset rays, he knew that his horse must gallop homeward or darkness might come and hide such cracks and fissures in the ice as were dangerous. The haunts of the birds which he chiefly loved were on the side of the islands turned to the open sea, for at this time ice had formed on all sides, and stretched without a break for a mile or so into the open. There was a joy in riding upon this that made riding upon the bay tame and uninteresting, for not only was the seaward shore of island and dune wilder, but the ice here might at any time break from the shore, or divide itself up into large islands, and when the wind blew he fancied he heard the waves heaving beneath it, and the excitement which comes with danger, which by some law of mysterious nature is one of the keenest forms of pleasure, would animate his horse and himself as they flew over it. His horse was not one of the native ponies. It was a well-bred, delicately shaped beast, accustomed to be made a friend of by its rider, and giving sympathetic response to all his moods. The horse belonged to Madame Le Maître, and was similar to the one she rode. This, together with many other things, proved to Caius 
that the lady who lived so frugally had command of a certain supply of money, for it could not be an easy or cheap thing to transport good horses to these islands. Whatever he did, however his thoughts might be occupied, it was never long before they veered round to the subject that was rapidly becoming the one subject of absorbing interest to him. Before he realized what he did, his mind was confirmed in its habit. At morn, and at noontime, and at night, he found himself thinking of Madame Le Maitre. The lady he was in love with was the youthful, adventurous maiden who it seemed did not exist. The lady that he was always thinking of was the grave, subdued, self-sacrificing woman who in some way, he knew not how, carried the mystery of the other's existence within herself. His mind was full of almost nothing but questions concerning her. For admire and respect her as he might, he thought there was nothing in him that responded with anything like love to her grave demeanour and burdened spirit. End of Book Two Chapter 13 Recording by Bill Borst